Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. This is going to be a different sort of podcast. Uh, we are going to hear from several people who work for an awesome ministry in Uganda. It's called Cherish Uganda, which is a faith-based nonprofit organization dedicated to fostering hope and a promising future for families in need. The mission of Cherish is to transform our community spiritually through education, healthcare, and family strengthening. Originally an orphanage, Cherish has, has grown to engage in better, more holistic ways of caring for orphans and their families, and also provides health care, maternity care, education, uh, and discipleship and counseling for the local community of Garuga, Uganda, which is about 30 minutes outside of Kampala. So my family and I um, and a few friends visited uh, Cherish last June. We actually went to several different places in Kenya and Uganda, and one of the places we visited was Cherish. And if I'm um, totally honest, I, I have grown skeptical of the ways in which white Western Christians have historically engaged in ministries in in, in Africa in particular, but also other cross-cultural contexts. Um, I, uh, I think, I think there is a place for ministry partnership, but I think there has just been a lot of damage that has been done. Um, oftentimes because we don't pay attention to the, you know, some cultural differences. We don't realize how sometimes our well-meaning help can actually lead to long-term harm. And the list goes on and on. I've talked about this on the podcast before. I'm also a bit skeptical of the limitations or even, again, unforeseen harm that short-term mission trips can do. Now, before you uh, protest that statement, uh, I have engaged in many short-term mission trips, and I will continue to do so. I don't know if we should call them mission trips. Um, I like cross-cultural uh, mi ministry experience might be a better way to frame it. Um, but I've been, I've, I've been skeptical of, of, again, some of the unforeseen damage that short-term trips uh, can do. So what did we do? We took a bunch of white people on a short-term trip to Africa. But part of the goal was to see uh, what are some ministries that are very aware of the the unforeseen dangers, how money can play a weird role, some of the cross-cultural differences. Um, are there ministries doing this well? And I got in touch with Brent Phillips, who was one of the early leaders of Cherish Uganda over over the last several months. He's actually been on the podcast before. You you might have heard, remember you might remember the conversation I had with him last spring. And from what I can tell, I'm like, man, you guys seem to be doing something really really awesome here. You're very aware of all of the unforeseen damage that can come from white westerners doing ministry in Africa and seem to be navigating that really well. So I wanted to see. I want to see what does a good short-term trip look like. Um so that's what this is. This is filmed and recorded uh on site in Cherish Uganda. So this I know this is coming out a few months after it was recorded, but uh you're going to hear uh, first from Brent Phillips. Um and then you're going to hear from several people uh local Ugandans who work for Cherish uh, just to hear their heart, hear what they do, hear how discipleship pervades everything that this ministry does. Um, if you love missions, you love cross-cultural ministry, I think you'll really, really enjoy this uh, very unique uh, series of conversations that we're going to have on this episode. Uh, I would like to direct your attention to some links in the show notes. If you feel led to support the mission and the work that Cherish Uganda is doing, um, look, I, I'm one who, is, again... <laughs> Since I'm airing out all my skepticisms, you know, there is, sometimes it's hard to know, like, wh what's a good cause to give to? How can I trust a ministry? Do I know where the money's going? Are they using it well? I, how do I even know that? I, I can say firsthand, Cherish is an absolutely stunning ministry that is well, well worth your contribution. Um yeah, I'll just leave it at that. We we do talk a little about a little bit about finances toward the end, and I just want you to know that Brent, neither Brent nor the team at Cherish at all was asking for this, but I I just said no. I, I want to invite 
uh, our uh, listeners and watchers, if you're watching on YouTube, to uh, consider donating to the, the great work that Cherish is doing. Um, and yeah, since this is filmed in sight, you might want to pop over to the YouTube version of this. You can see the kind of background of Cherish, which is situated in, in kind of a jungly era uh, area just south of um, uh, of Kampala. So. Uh, without further ado, uh, please welcome to the show uh, the one and only uh, Brent Phillips and his awesome team at Cher- Cherish U- Uganda. All right, I am here with my good friend Brent Phillips live uh, from Uganda, Cherish <laughs> Uganda. Brent, uh, this is this is a <laughs> I've never filmed in the jungle before, so <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for being part of this. Um, we have so much to talk about. I will say first of all that. Um, we did record an episode uh, a few months ago, um, episode 1,168. 1, so this is almost like a part two follow-up. In that episode, we were kind of uh, exploring what Cherish Uganda is, uh, learning about the good and bad of short-term missions, uh, the good and bad of like Westerners doing ministry in Africa. And then we decided, all right, we want to come see Cherish Uganda on a short-term mission trip <laughs> <laughs> and try not to do um, things wrong, you know. So we've had an amazing week here. So um, why don't you give us a, you know, there was that previous episode. People want the full, thorough picture. They can go listen to that. But give us a, a, a for, for most who are not going to go back and listen to that, <laughs> g- give us a brief version. What is Cherish Uganda and how did you get involved in this ministry? Yeah, Cherish started off uh, probably 17 or 18 years ago as an orphanage for kids with HIV. Mm-hmm. And HIV was just, it still is an issue, but it was a significant issue that was just a lot of untapped uh, ministry opportunities and needs. And there was a, a church network from the UK came down, started Cherish. And we, at that time, we were pastoring in the States, mm-hmm. been doing that our whole lives. And through just, you know, instances that can only be described as divine. My wife ends up in Uganda, stumbles across this little, huh. little seemed like a piece of heaven at the time, which it even more so does now. And we just felt like, I think this is where God wants us now and next and never a part of the plan. And God plucked us out of Austin, Texas and moved our family here. And we jumped into um, ministry that has been, the most difficult, costly, and taxing of our life, and yet the most rich, deep, and fruitful at the same time. And over the course of the years, Church has changed from an HIV orphanage that was solely focused on the kids that we brought on site to moved into family-based care, moving those kids into either kinship care, like family members we found, or um, foster care. We did adopt a few out. And then we had a few that we actually did transition into independent living that have kind of mm-hmm. grown up. And we are now, uh, our real focus is spiritual formation. Mm-hmm. We are a spiritual transformation ministry that endeavors to do that through healthcare, through education, and through social work. Mm-hmm. And so what used to be a ministry that was focused on this site has now spread out to into this community and into even other parts of the world as people are starting to go, what's happening over there? Can you talk about that a bit? And mm-hmm. so it's been just an amazing journey. Mm-hmm. Like I said, really difficult and hard mm-hmm. and at the same time, just so joyful. Can you tell us the various ministries that are uh, happening here at Cherish? Yeah. Cause there, there's, you know, we've been here all week and, and I want to come to you like the, the, the nature of this short term trip, which I, I would say, has been the best short-term experience I've, I've ever had. And, and it's so intentional. And so um, maybe, yeah, intentional, I guess is the best word. Um, tell us about the various ministries happening here on, on, yeah. on the, on the 25 acres that we're yeah. sitting on. Um, healthcare is a key one. Yeah. Um, it's a massive need for our community. And we started off just as a small clinic that was probably the size of yeah. what you can see in this camera and has now moved into a full scale 24 hours, seven days a week hospital. Mm -hmm. And we have a pharmacy and a lab and Mm -hmm. a counselor and kind of a full service thing Mm -hmm. that just focuses on whatever needs walk through the door. So we deal with a lot of tropical diseases, you deal with Mm -hmm. malaria and foodborne illnesses, Mm -hmm. a lot of accidents, just Mm -hmm. people falling in fires, all the just Mm -hmm. crazy things that happen in this community. And recently in December, we opened up our maternity ward really saw the need of 
mothers, mothers giving birth to healthy babies. And it really stems from our first stem from our idea of like, like if, if we're here to really kind of meet this need that HIV has brought about mm -hmm. the number one way to, of transmission for HIV in Uganda is mother to child. That's the number one. That's okay. the number one. Okay. And so yeah. it just makes sense that we, we need to tackle that. Like let's, you know, the old, let's stop pulling kids out of the river, but let's go up and find out why they're falling in. Right. Yeah. And so hmm. it's, it's, it's things well beyond my understanding medically, because yeah. I'm not a doctor, but an HIV positive mom can give birth mm -hmm. to an HIV negative child if it's done correctly with the right procedures and the right equipment. And so that's what we do. Okay. We, we start with those moms as soon as they find out they're pregnant mm -hmm. and we endeavor to walk the whole entire journey with them all the way through till post it, um, and immunizations and all, all the way with trainings and discipleship mm -hmm. and ultrasounds and all the stuff they need to really and make sure that that baby grows up and that that mom understands mm -hmm. who yeah. she is and who God is and the whole midst of it. So that, yeah. that thing has been a really, that's a recent thing. That's why I'm yeah. really excited about that. Yeah. Um, and then we have a school and we used to run a very traditional Ugandan curriculum and then COVID hit, shut everything down. The country shut down school for two years, mm -hmm. the longest of any country in the world. Yeah, it's crazy. And um, at first that was a very negative thing. Um, well, the way, it was negative, but quickly we realized this is actually a great opportunity for us to even just evaluate mm -hmm. are we doing school the way that we feel like we're mm. supposed to do and like and really start to start to ask god about it and ended up completely flipping that over and scraping it off and started over and have built a neurodevelopment curriculum and really starting to work with processing and mm. problem solving and we teach basic reading and writing and math mm -hmm. so they're going to walk away with some real good just skills to live life but at the same time, we're just trying to help those brains get rewritten and really be able to focus on not the trauma and the mm -hmm. just the tough stuff that they've grown up in, but how do they rise above that? And all the while, we're discipling those students as we go through. So most of the kids have some kind of some kind of learning disability, or what would be the language, mm, or they're uh, underdeveloped? Pro or? Probably, yeah, quite underdeveloped. Okay. Nutrition is a big issue in our community, mm -hmm. or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. um, uh, typically within this impoverished community like this, you have a lot of moms and dads, they're either working or trying to get work and mm -hmm. kids spend a lot of time alone or laid under a mango tree mm -hmm. while mom's digging in the gardens. And, mm -hmm. and so there's just not a lot of those development things that happen. Mm -hmm. And so those, a lot of those milestones are just missed and either come way delayed or don't happen at all. Mm -hmm. And so we're just trying to pull that back in and kind of start to rewrite mm -hmm. that story. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. So, so medical education, medical education yeah. uh, and then we have social work teams mm -hmm. and those are the, those are the ones that are going out into the community. Mm -hmm. And so full social work write-ups on, you know, key patients that are struggling with issues at home, students. Mm -hmm. So basically teachers, nurses, they'll be like, they sense something's going on here well beyond what is presented as an educational mm -hmm. need or a, me a medical need. Mm -hmm. And the social work team gets called in and out in the community they go. Okay. And so they end up doing marriage counseling yeah. and like this crazy, the stuff the social workers end up doing, yeah. um, just helping people with health and hygiene stuff. It's just yeah. that so many needs are presented as they kind of walk yeah. in and amongst our people. So yeah. those are kind of the three main things we do. Um, pastoral training, mm -hmm. local pastors. We do a sports ministry with the, we have the, one of the only full size level, <laughs> Uh, soccer field for miles yeah. and miles and miles. So it's kind of a magnet for the community. Yeah. And so we do a lot on that soccer pitch as well. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we talked about in the last episode and one of the things we've talked about before, I've talked about a lot on the podcast is just the role of Western, white, wealthy missionaries in mm -hmm. a place like Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, I, th I would say over the years, it has been a little discouraging because you keep seeing like, okay, we did this wrong. We did that wrong. And then you have colonialism and the kind of lasting mark that has. And then there's just so many like problems. It seems like, can, can you summarize just maybe if that's new to some people, like what are some of the unintentional problems that Westerners can bring when they do ministry in a place like Africa? And then, mm -hmm. what, then the follow-up is going to be what can right. Western missionaries do well? Cause I think you've, yeah. you've been through a, a a growth period in that for sure and in my opinion you've everything your whole perspective now i think okay i think you you have 
you've hit the sweet spot. So yeah, take us through that yeah. journey. Um, we've been with Cherish for about 14 years. And when we first came, there was some wise people that just told us, you need to come as a student. Mm. Don't think you're going to roll in here and have all the solutions. If they were that easy, they'd have already been fixed. Yeah. <laughs> like there's some deeper issues mm. and you really need to just sit. And so we did our best just to sit and watch and look and listen, both to what's happening here in our community and also to the others that have gone before us and what's, what happened there. And I think that one of the main issues is with our, our mindset as a Westerner is we're a very efficient, effective, results-driven, get stuff done kind of people. And so when we roll into a situation and there are things that don't look as they should, we want to be immediately start to fix them. Mm -hmm. And what happens is one, we don't really have a clear picture of what even caused that problem. Mm -hmm. And so our solution either might've been tried and it failed before, or it's not going to work or it's going to hurt people in the process. Mm -hmm. And so we just jump in way too early. And often what happens too, is we basically are telling this community, you guys don't know how to do this. Mm. You don't have what it takes, but don't worry. I do. And I'm here and we're going to make this happen. And it's not this intentional thought. Like we don't walk in and bust open the Superman outfit and <laughs> going to do it. But it's kind of the air that we step into it with often when we step into these kinds of, mm. of uh, environments. And so what we have really tried to do is figure out how do we step into this ministry and not come with all of the answers to the apparent problems, but how do we empower and train and encourage and equip the people that God has already placed here and we work together as teams. Are yeah. those wild? Those are wild dogs that <laughs> sometimes crawl into the fence. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Security will deal with those at some point. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's one of the major ones is is just we don't come at it as from a team aspect of mm. we're in this with you. Mm. And there is countless, like all over Africa, there's been billions of dollars sent to Africa. Yeah. And you kind of look around and go, what? what? Where'd where, it, where go? it go? Yeah. You know, and where you roll into a village and you'll see like this beautiful massive generator that's sitting there yeah. and it's not working. No one has power. <laughs> and you find out, wow. Somebody bought that and brought it and set it up and flipped the switch and they did a little party and walked away. And the first time it broke, no one knew what to do, mm. where to get the parts to fix it. And now it is a relic <laughs> that sits there that thousands and thousands of dollars were dumped into. And now it is a clothesline. Mm. So a lot of those kinds of things, because I didn't think through the whole process, like, yeah, we want to bring power that could be amazing to this community. but. What about is that thing breaks down and how do mm. people maintain it? And where do you get the parts to actually fix that? And what really will this do? You know, there, there is some, there's some great water well projects that have happened all over Africa. Just some amazing things. But there's a flip side of that, of when women are walking a couple miles to get water every day, there's something that happens in that walk mm. that we don't even think about and the relationship things that happen. And all of a sudden the well that you had there, you now have moved and put a well here where they used to go to the river. Now they're here and now that walk has stopped. And now these women relationally aren't connecting anymore. Oh, and wow. all of a sudden now there's starting to be some relational fractures within the village and community and that weren't there for decades oh, wow. that now are there because, oh, you shouldn't have to walk to the river. Let's bring it here. Oh. And it, it's like I said, it's not intentional. It's just unless we sit and kind of really look and understand what is really happening here and is my solution actually going to make things better yeah. or is it just more about efficiency and effectiveness and that's yeah. what we're going to focus on relationships is everything here like if, you, if yeah. you're not focused on building relationships yeah business is based on relationships yeah. ministry is based everything is based on relationships yeah yeah, yeah. all of it one of the things so with the the medical services here with the school with everything here nothing's free no Tell us about that because I think the mindset of Westerners, we have all this money. Gosh, we can solve it just by, well, we'll buy this, we'll buy that. Well, we can, we can pay for everything here. But you, even the, the poorest of the poor have to pay something. They come yeah. in, deliver a baby, and like, I don't, if they say, I don't have any money. Like, no, we have a seat. And we so talk tell, about us, it figured out. Yeah. tell us about the logic behind that. Yeah, um, it's, really, it's really about dignity. Hmm. It's really that saying, we're going to come alongside of you. It's not that you are so poor and we are so sorry, but mm -hmm. don't worry, we'll fix it for you. Mm -hmm. 
Good, so we're going to come alongside you. Let's figure out what has God given you, and then let's see what we have, and let's put it together, and let's do this thing. And so, like, you see it play out in, like, school when it comes time to pay the school fees, and you'll see a, a, a parent or a grandmother come in, and they'll pull out all these coins, and they'll put out the little mm -hmm. bit that they're, and, and they slide that across the table with, like, yeah, this is my granddaughter, and I'm paying oh, wow. for her to go to school today. Huh. And just that, now that granddaughter doesn't see is like, oh, my grandma's needs a handout. Like, grandma put me put me through school. Uh, and we subsidize greatly, right, you know, yeah. to make that happen. But that dignity piece is so important. Mm -hmm. And to empower them, like, we're doing this. And we're not going to sit and do all this work to pay for this while you don't work. Mm -hmm. Like, let's help you figure out how to get a job. And let's, well, there's a lot of just walking life with people that mm -hmm. just even comes around. How do I help them? Because mm -hmm. what happens too is if you don't have any money, no, well, what do you have? That's when social workers get involved and realize, oh, you got some chickens there. You know what? If you give us eggs for the next two weeks from that chicken, okay. you take half the eggs for you and we'll take half the eggs for us. And mm -hmm. we calculate per egg, the market value. Look at, you're going to pay for this mm -hmm. in, you know, four weeks. Yeah. And just like the, the thought process, oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. And just let's engage with this together. Yeah. So yeah, everything costs something little, like a baby. It's remarkable. Uh, the <laughs> cost for us is $107 to have a child to give birth here, which is virtually nothing compared to, yeah, yeah. you know, but we require the mom to pay $7. Seven, dollars. okay. Yeah, your average Ugandan makes $2 a day. So right. you're got to figure out how to okay. get three and a half days wages you got to come up with okay. to pay for that baby. Mm -hmm. And so some people it's the payment plan. Like there's some, you know, options we work through with people. So we subsidize with a hundred bucks, mom pays her seven okay. and yeah. yeah. What are some of the problems that you being a white guy here, a Mazungu, you know, mm -hmm. you come in, you do ministry, like what are some of the unforeseen problems that that brings? Like when you go out into the community and, and you know, you're building relationships, you're doing ministry, or even here on mm -hmm. uh, Cherish, like, yeah, what are some of the hurdles that that brings just you as a white person here? Do people yeah. look to you kind of like... They do, yeah. yeah. There's oftentimes you'll be sitting in, a, you know, meetings and they always look to the white guy for the answer <laughs> and you're just constantly trying to redirect mm -hmm. to to our leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get stead into various meetings in the community and, you know, mm -hmm. they do that. I think they're the issue, you know, you might not feel wealthy. I don't feel like a wealthy individual. Right. But compared to the amount of money that... I have access to compared to the amount of money in our community. I am extremely wealthy mm. and they know that. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that gets in the barrier of relationship okay. and you're wondering, is this person trying to get close to me because mm. what they're going to want later. And then when they do ask, like, how does that all work? So it ends up, oh, we're building a relationship based on what you can get rather than just, mm. oh, we're just two guys hanging out. Okay. And so it takes some time to kind of, it takes longer to build that time. And the, the truth is, We've been here for 14 years and we still get asked for money all the time, not from our staff. Occasionally, okay. if they have a really desperate time, they will. Mm -hmm. But from the community, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. It's just, I'm not sure that's going to go away yeah. anytime soon. Yeah. And so that that does get in the way. But you worked yourself out of a job, basically, right? Like Cherish Now. Yeah. yeah was, we, that, was that intentional? And yeah. why is that important? Yeah, from the very beginning, Cherish was set up. Like at some point, we want the nationals to run this place. Mm -hmm. On the, all the day to day, mm -hmm. and so Lee and I lived here for six, seven years, and just poured our heart into it and mm -hmm. into our people. Really, mm -hmm. I'm like you asked me the other day. Was it yesterday? We were at the school. Like, do these kids know you? Like, no, mm -hmm. they don't, yeah. because we're not in just investing all of our time and energy into programming with our with uh, kids at school. Like, our staff did that. In the, the beginning, we did a lot of that, mm -hmm. a lot of mentoring and training and modeling and. But then once that training was done, we stepped back out of that. Mm -hmm. And so we are, we come here. I spend a lot of time doing meetings. Lee was here a month and a half ago in meetings from sunup to sundown, but that's just all of our staff. Mm -hmm. It's just staff development and staff training. And how do we continue to encourage you and empower you to do what God's called you to do here? So, so right now on the ground, the day to day is completely run by nationals. Yeah. I mean, you're still, you know, from the States. From the States, involved, yeah. But and, and probably four to six meetings a week. And those are just, you know, just discipleship meetings, probably half of them. Mm -hmm. Don't anything okay. to do with administrative yeah. tasks. And the other part is really focused on accountability. Okay. And just, you know, 
this is what we say we're going to do. I'm here to hold you accountable to actually do it. Yeah. Let's talk through the problems that come up. And, but yeah, yeah. we're not, we're not yeah. running programs. We're not doing yeah. any of that stuff. It's yeah. just all about how do we just help our staff to be who they're supposed to be in this place. So we're here with eight people on our short-term mission trip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and over the years, man, I, I've, I have gotten uh, a growing education on the pros and cons of short-term trips. And I, I feel like for a while, I just kept hearing con after con after con. <laughs> but we're here. We're on a short-term trip. And you host teams. Um, you're very, probably the most intentional of a host, not just you, but just Cherish as a whole, in hosting a short-term trip. Can you tell us a bit about what that looks like mm -hmm. and the logic behind how you go about hosting teams the way you do? Yeah. Um, Lee and I, we've been on a lot of those as well over the years, pastoring, you know, we've, mm -hmm. you know, been to lots of stuff in South America, Brazil and Honduras and doing these trips, even leading some of these trips and just realizing a lot of the things we were doing, like, I'm not sure we're leaving any sort of lasting thing. And I'm not sure we're going away as changed as we could be in the process. And then we move here and start to look around and go, oh yeah, I think there's a way better way to do this. Cause we're start to think, oh, we need to bring a team out and they're going to build this building. But then think, all right, I bring out 10 people who don't really know how to construct any buildings. And if they do, they don't know how to do it based on what's needed here. Mm -hmm. And so they're building a building. Meanwhile, I got people out in the village who need jobs. They're yeah. looking through the fence <laughs> at <laughs> substandard work going on with people who don't even free need labor. The work. Yeah. And so Why are they taking my job? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we just decided that we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. We don't want to bring people here to do work that our people can already do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this idea of how we just want to come and hold the kids and love the kids and mm -hmm. pray on kids. Well, you're assuming we don't already love and hold and pray for mm. kids. Like we do that here. We don't need you to come do it and stay here for a week and then leave because mm. it's all built on relationship. So when we bring teams, what we want you to do is just step in and be a part of what's happening here. Mm -hmm. And so we call it live the rhythm. And so you've been in the school, you've been walking security, you've mm. been slashing grass. You've been <laughs> like, you have been doing all the things that we do every day. Yeah. Because if we hit the button, pause button, and we sing and dance and we do things, and then when you leave, we're like, man, we're a week behind, and they didn't really see what we do here. Mm -hmm. So we want you to see what we do here, and we want to keep doing what we do here, and not we don't want you to get in the way. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we want to build relationships. Like, you already know the names of a lot of people. Yeah, You've been working here for, what, three or four days? Yeah. But you could probably name yeah. many, many people because you've just been having conversations. You've just mm -hmm. been walking and working and encouraging and mm -hmm. when you say things to them like that's amazing like well i i say those things <laughs> but it doesn't mean yeah, fresh much. voice yeah i've heard that all yeah, the time yeah. so you just we just want to inject you into what we're already doing and hopefully you'll walk away encouraged from what god's doing here you'll have some relationships mm -hmm. and hopefully god's you know changing your heart in the midst of the process yeah um, yeah so we don't want teams to be a burden to us because we got an important work to do here yeah. and we want to be the best experience for them. So we also like limit the teams. Like we don't want you to bring in more than 12 people. Okay. It's too disruptive. Yeah. And we don't want you to bring in less than three because it's just, a, it's not as good an experience for you. Mm. So three to 12 people, this is okay. what it looks like. We also, we require you to cover your expenses and mm -hmm. a little bit extra because mm -hmm. who knows how things go right. during the week. And so, we want everybody to kind of carry their own weight and let's do this together. And even if you don't like slashing grass, you guess what? You're going to slash some grass. <laughs> <laughs> I slashed for uh, almost two hours yesterday. I had the blisters to show for it. If they don't know what that is, it's like a machete that's kind of bent on the end. And you just go and you you are mowing the it's lawn or the weeds. The grass, yeah. And man, they sharpen that thing. I'm like, Super if this sharp. nicks my shin, I'm not going to have a shin anymore. I mean, one swipe and just like, whoo, just levels. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, yeah it, was, great. it was amazing. Um, walking the security, see so security guards that walk the, 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 the whole perimeter, perimeter mm -hmm. and uh, for an hour and a half, mm -hmm. there I am with uh, Scovia or Alex, you know, walking around and, mm -hmm. and just the, the, the relational time that was, you know, Scovia loves just all the, she's taught me so much about the plants and, and all the different trees. And she'd say, what's that? I'm like, I don't know what that is. What's this? I don't know. Like, <laughs> and she would sit there and uh, give me a lesson in it and then talk about where she grew up. And yeah, yeah I think the dignity piece, like mm. this is my country yeah. and this is 
and I know this and you don't. Let, <laughs> let, let me share this with you, yeah. which is the exact opposite of I'm here to come tell you what to right. do. So you almost inverted, like, rather than come and do something, a project, get things done, it's come and build relationships, get mm-hmm. to know people while they are doing the work that they're going to do next week when we're gone. Yeah, yeah. they've been doing yeah. it for years. They're going to keep on doing it. Mm. I love that. I mean, honestly, yeah, we've been on many short-term trips, and, and uh, it was the most intentional uh, I think short-term trip I've ever been on. Well, I've been on good ones too. There's been, you know, um, good ones. Some that just kind of you come and, all right, what do you want to do? You know, and others that they want you to, yeah, paint the wall or whatever. Right. And and this was very well well organized. So um, we're going to get a chance to know, uh, get to meet some of the people here. Um, mm-hmm. how, how many staff do you have here on, is it 50? 50, 55. 55, okay. Mm-hmm. So we're going to get a, a a few different people we're going to talk to. The first one we're going to talk to is uh, Eddie. <laughs> Eddie, who has been our uh, host, our driver, our host. He's hung out with us at the hotel we're staying at. Um, t- give us, br- just set up who Eddie is, because he's just been just an absolute delight to get to yeah, know. Yeah. yeah, Eddie, he grew up in this community. So he's a little boy who grew up playing in all these trees and living in this in our village. And he got a job. His first job here was a receptionist at our hospital. Mm-hmm. And he applied like everyone else. We get when we when we post a job, we get sometimes hundreds of applicants, wow. huh. and it's desperate times. You know, people really looking for work, and so he rose to the top. And he's such a people guy that we knew that was the spot for him. So yeah. he started by sitting behind a desk and just serving and being available to do whatever. And then slowly start adding respect, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. And now he's IT. He's over transportation. He's host for teams. Got all his hand in lots of different areas. Mm-hmm. He's kind of one of those little catch-all positions. Mm-hmm. Um, he's since got married since he's become a staff person here, has a child, and really trying to do stuff differently mm. than the typical cultural norms. Mm. Um, really trying to invest in his relationship with his wife and view her as much more than just, you mm-hmm. take care of the kids and cook for me. Mm. But like he takes the things he's learning here spiritually, he... He goes home and they sit and talk about that in the evening. Like wow. this is the scriptures we talked about. This is, and which is just rare, mm. rare, for a He's, marriage to be kind yeah, of centered so, around. Yeah, and there's still there's still <clears throat> some cultural norms there that aren't you know what he wants them to be, but they they really want to make mm. things different. Cool. I mean, he's the only shop in town that doesn't open on Sunday. Oh, we, wow. did, we did a lot of teaching on Sabbath and huh. um, you know figure out <clears throat> what that day is, and they've picked Sunday, and so they close the shop. Yeah, it's the only one. Like, why aren't you open? Why aren't you open? Well, because this is why we do this, and that's his wife normally works in the shop. Yeah. So yeah, he's one of the few dads you'll see carrying his kid. Mm. Wow. It's that idea of like, oh, like I should be investing in her. Wow. And yeah, so he's a good guy. Really that's good great. Dude. All right, well, we're gonna get to know Eddie. What's up, man? <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Eddie has been our amazing host, uh, swim partner. We went swimming yesterday yeah. <laughs> in that freezing yeah. pool. <laughs> Um, Eddie, uh, why don't you give us your, what's your full name, Eddie? My name is uh, Chijambu Edward, but people prefer calling me Eddie, and I also like it. You like Eddie? Yeah. A little easier for us uh, Mazungo to say Eddie? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, like, in Cherish and in our community, they call me Eddie, so, okay. yeah. yeah. So you've been at Cherish for how long now? I'm going to be making nine years in November. Okay. Yeah. Uh, tell us about when you, when you first came to Cherish, you, you applied for a job, got the job. Uh, what was that, the initial few weeks, few months, first year? Like, what was that like for you working for, for Cherish? Um, I joined Cherish when I was uh, a young boy. Um, I wrote my application to Cherish and then dropped it at the gate. I found a lady called Sidonia, had not applied for like being a receptionist okay. to my first job. I just put as uh, any like any free space that you have, I'm available to come. <laughs> yeah. And when they called me to come for an interview, I didn't have like qualifications or papers like <laughs> in the bag. So the first day that I came, I saw <clears throat> a group of people, like 10 people that are waiting, big people, like a bit mature with hands of files, like papers that shows that qualified. <laughs> I was almost going back home because I like, what am I going to answer? in this interview, see the people that have come. But I stayed and waited for my time and entered into the room. They asked me a few questions that I answered. I think it took me like 10 minutes to be out. 
But when I was going out of the gate, I was like, ah, no, I cannot make it because these people that I saw are more uh -huh. like they have what it takes to have that job. And I didn't know that I was being called for receptionist. So when I came, they told me that uh, um, you wrote your application, but we are trying out to get a receptionist. Okay. So I'm like, hmm, because I said any free space, so I'm happy to do it. But when I was going home, because my home is close to Cherish, I just walk. Uh -huh. So like uh, three minutes walk. Um, I, when I reached the gate, I was like, uh, I shouldn't expect a call here. Yeah. yeah. But surprisingly, like after four days, I was called that okay. I did um, come for the second interview. Okay. So I was really happy that uh, mm -hmm. I'm joining a family that I, I didn't know about, but I joined, I came in for my second interview and it was more like interacting like asking questions that were not so difficult for me and then they told me that we have offered you a job oh, wow. yeah yeah what, what did you feel when i you... felt so happy <laughs> so happy you know from school and you know coming to work i didn't have like that experience i was like ah what am I going to be doing at, at the reception? But mm. I was happy that I got what I'll yeah. be doing. Yeah. Do you remember when he first got hired? I do. Yeah, I wasn't part of the interview process. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, and you know, at Cherish, we qualifications are important for some jobs, but character is okay. obviously way more important. And yeah, Eddie was one of those guys. Is like even this day one, you're like, ah, yeah, we made a good hire on this one. What did you see in Eddie? Like, how would you? Uh, highly relational, just a people guy and a servant. Like, mm. we'll do whatever you ask him to do whenever with a smile. Mm. Never, mm. never without, just all in. And mm. so he didn't, his, he's not the kind of guy, this is my job description, so I'm going to sit here behind this desk. Okay. So he did that well, but a need is there. He's in. Mm. Wow, that's he's great. In. Yeah. So discipleship is a huge part of everything at Cherish, whether it's the school, it's not just teaching kids, it's discipleship with among staff, with the students, uh, the hospital, not just delivering babies, it's there's discipleship, everything is discipleship. The security is discipleship. Uh, how have you, Eddie, grown in Jesus over the last eight years? Like, what's that process been like becoming a disciple of, of, of Jesus? What have you learned? Um, when I just joined, I knew about going to church and mm -hmm. then like every Sunday, and then come home like that kind of normal, like usual things that you do. But when I came to Cherish, I realized that uh, there's something that I should do, like beyond like I used to do. Like I would claim that I follow Jesus, but I wasn't so much committed than the, the years that I've spent at Cherish because uh, I've been able to meet people that are so really good and close to God. Mm -hmm. Those people that live exemplary life in Cherish they have helped me to grow into like who Jesus wants me mm. to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking at Pastor Brent, Uncle Sam, the people that lead us here. Uncle Sam? Yes. <laughs> Sam's an executive director. Yes. I haven't heard him called Uncle Sam yet, but that's, yes. yeah. that's a very cultural. Yeah. Someone older than you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A male, you call him uncle. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I've been looking at those people and I'm like, I think I should be like these guys. And mm. they've helped me to grow. Like Pastor Brent, he's always challenging me with how he lives life. Mm. He's always the same with, with visitors on site, whether no visitors. He's like a true man of God. He portrays out that image of Jesus. Mm. So if you have that chance, that opportunity of seeing like those people in your life, and you're so willing to do what it takes to be, mm. that has really helped me to grow and um, to help others. I also have like... People that look at me like, we want to be like you, but mm. I'm, I'm not taking that for granted because I know that there are people that have invested in me. And like, it's it's our culture here to, to live like Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that we are perfect. We mm -hmm. still struggle in areas, but at least if you look at my life and then the people out of Cherish, there is a big difference. Mm. Like, And I cannot tell how my life would be when mm. I had not changed, when yeah. I had not joined Cherish because I've learned a lot, but the most key part is me getting closer to, you know, with God and living like Jesus. So that helps me like keep going. And, you know, I already say to myself, whenever I come here, I've not come to work. Yes, there is a paycheck at the end of the month, but I'm coming to serve. This is my mm. second home that I got when I'm a young man. Mm. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've heard that from almost everybody I talk to. They all talk about the environment, the community here. I was talking to Alex, one of the security mm-hmm. guards, and he says there's just something almost like in the air here mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. is just, re- it's just like refreshing, but also just like encouraging and challenging. Like the, the, the Christian community, the, deci- the communal discipleship here is just, mm-hmm. it pervades everything, it seems like. Um, I'm curious because I've learned this over the last few days. Like, t- tell us about Eddie. Um, what does a traditional African like family marriage look like? <laughs> and then, how have you grown? Because I've seen uh, Brent. You've talked about this, and you've mm-hmm. talked about this. That like you're you're doing things kind of differently than maybe a typical African family marriage might might look. So, what has that process been like? Um, that, that process is really good. Um, if I would say, if you've allowed Jesus in your heart. Marriage gets to be not so easy, but at least there are those challenges that come. But a person that have accepted Christ with your heart, Mm -hmm. there are things that uh, we do differently than other people that don't know Christ. Mm -hmm. And then the people that we choose to look at, um, I'm sorry that you've not had the chance of seeing Leah Mm -hmm. and Brent. I'm not saying that because he's there, Mm -hmm. but it's what I'll say even if he's not around. But Mm -hmm. if you had a chance of seeing uh, Brent and Leah, you'd be like, ah, there's so many things that I need to pick from these two guys. Mm. So that, that they portray out that love. And um, I always tell Brenda, I'm always challenged, like seeing you walking with Leah holding hands. Like mm-hmm. it's such a good thing that I've not tried with my wife, Dora. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So um, looking at Brent and Leah, they hope us like, even if we have challenges, we know how to uh-huh. handle them. And then the constant meetings that we have, you can find like when I'm meeting Brent, talking about like marriage, not mm-hmm. cherish. Like we, sometimes we talk about work, but he invests more time in uh-huh. me being in good terms with Dora. Like uh-huh. that openness that if something happens and you come and you know, how do you go by uh-huh. this? And so um, people out of cherish, I would say they struggle much and you might look at them like going to divorce because um, mm. Um, they don't have those people in their life that they look at and because um, they just claim that they know Jesus, but they don't want to be like him. Mm. So it is sometimes hard. Yeah. Mm. So what are some things you do with Dora that's different than, say, your neighbor and his wife? Um, like for me, we always, uh, I have time to meet with Dora. Yes, I spend much time with her, but we have specific days that we are meeting, like meeting you. She brings a chair, I bring my chair, and then we talk. Mm. And most people won't do that, though, like okay. that kind of meeting, because they know mm, I sleep with them and we live in the same house. But you can find there is no communication. Mm. So that helps us to, you know, to come up with those gaps that have come in our lives. And she's talking about something maybe I'm not doing well, or I'm talking about something that she's doing well. So like um, working together in the village, it's something that it's not so common. Like you find a man and woman, husband and wife, like walking together. Mm. It's it's not so common, but you can find us on foot, like walking. Mm. And then uh, let me say I have a meeting here and it is going to end late. I must mm. call her that, you know what? I'm supposed to be home by six, but I'm going to come at eight because I have a meeting. Mm. So when you do that, when um, you have people that are not of cherish, you'll be like, ah, <laughs> you're asking permission from your wife. <laughs> right? Yeah, so those kind of things help us like to be close to each other. And they look like you, you, if you call when someone says like, am I watching a movie? You have to ask for like, you're coming late and you married that wife. So they're like, for me, I can't tell my wife that I'm going anywhere. So uh, those things like, yeah. Uh, what would you say? One more question. Um, what's the, what would you say is the number one thing main thing that you've learned about a uh, Jesus uh, from being at, at Cherish. So, I mean, you, you said you were a Christian before coming here, right? Or at least you, you know, you confess Jesus. Yeah. Now I've been here almost, you know, eight and a half going on nine years. Um, now, when you consider who Jesus is, like what really stands out from, from being at Cherish? Um, what stands out for me is that Jesus or God speaks. Mm. I, I didn't know that. I used to know that it's if I want to maybe speak to God, I should go through my pastor. I should go through my church leader. Like I didn't have that connection with God that I have. Mm. Like I thought 
me, I have no authority to speak to God. Mm. But Cherish or oh, Cherish has helped me to know that, you know, you have the, the pastor is the same like you. Mm -hmm. The things that he does, you can also like, he doesn't need to be him mm -hmm. to speak to God on my behalf. Yeah. And God will always speak to me. Yeah. So that has helped me to know that Jesus and God, they will really speak to me and always so, listen to their voice. Yeah. I don't need anyone between me and God that I should go through. Yeah. yeah. So tonight is our final day, our final day at uh, Cherish. What's going to happen tonight? The big celebration, big party tonight? Or? Yes. So um, today we have a culture dance. Culture have, dance. Yeah. We have our <laughs> staff that uh, <clears throat> will be, we call it presenting. We yeah. have from North. East and then Central. Okay. So there will be dancing in their attires of the culture attires. So it will be exciting. And in all, including the American team, we, we have our own <laughs> culture dance that yeah. we're going to try to pull We can't wait to, to see <laughs> American dance. Yeah, I bet you can. <laughs> yeah, so it will be a great time seeing you dance with Pastor Brent joining you. Yeah. They put us in the back row, yeah, me and Brent. Back. Yeah, they tried to put us outside <laughs> of the, in the, the jungle, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> we've been doing that with every team that we okay. cherish. So at their final day, we organize yeah. that. And then besides the dancing, there is connection with, you yeah. know, with stuff. And then we'll do pork together. Yeah. Yeah. So it's exciting. Pork. Yeah, China. I'm excited about the yeah. pork. Right. Yeah. Fresh pork. Yeah. Well, thank you for... Uh, all of your hospitality, hanging out. I love that you hang out with us every night. When we go back to our hotel, you come with us, have dinner. You're there in the morning to pick us up. And like just the conversations we've had, it's been, this whole experience has been such a blessing because, Eddie, you've been a special part of it. So thank, thank you, you for welcoming us. Thank yeah. you too for, you know, leaving your homes and, you know, getting on the plane mm -hmm. for so many hours and coming to know what we do at Cherish. It yeah. makes us happy that uh, we are expanding the kingdom of God. Yeah. So thank you so much for thank your you. time. And um, it's been good having you with your family and then the two friends of yours. Yeah. It's, it's been a great time. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Eddie. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hello, Faith. How are you? Hello. <laughs> Fine. How are you? Good. Can you give us, give us your full name? What's your full name? Uh, my <laughs> name is Namakula Faith Trinity. Yes, that's it. Trinity, Trinity. Faith Trinity. Trinity. Mm -hmm. Ah, I like that name. That's a very biblical name. <laughs> faith too is also. So. What does that mean? What does your first name mean? Faith. Uh, no, the your Na Namakula. Namakula. Uh, I don't like the name. It's it's <laughs> it's basically a disease that it's like a skin disease. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Interesting. Okay. But, but we don't call you Namakula anymore. Namakula. Okay, we'll call you Faith. Yeah. Um, how long have you been at Cherish, Uganda? I would say 12 years, right? Something like that. Yeah, uh -huh. 12 years. And how did you come here? What was that like? I came when I think I was 10 to 12. Not sure really about my age. But I came little, as in primary four. Okay. And yeah, it were I was with my brothers, currently living with my brothers. Okay. And our neighbor was the one caring for us at the time. She brought me here. Mm -hmm. So you lived here mm -hmm. or, or when you yeah, first she she first moved into the homes into the church ah, okay. back when we were in an orphanage. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Were you scared when you came? Yes, I was very scared because where we lived was the town town place and when they were bringing me here i could only see forest village. forest and I'm like <laughs> I, was, I felt like i was going to be sacrificed but oh. then <laughs> child sacrifice it was like like sacrifice sacrifice because there are trees everywhere and i could not i could barely see a house and then when we reached i saw all these kids come up to me they were very happy they have photos now so my heart kind of come down. Yeah. Wait, I, does it get this straight? When you were coming up as a kid at the beginning, you thought you were being sacrificed? I was going to be sacrificed. Yeah, ch child sacrifice is still a thing in this country. Oh, my word. So yeah. you were, thought you were going to die? Yes. Well, when it's uh, forests, uh, like it's, uh, it's one of the signs that okay. you're going to such a place. Okay. And there were barely houses. In the road from the road to cherish. Wow. And then you saw kids, you're like, okay, yeah, maybe. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. Did you did you know this or did you find this out later, Brett? That, uh, as far as the child sacrifice yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we knew this. In fact, when we moved here, we either tattooed or pierced our children hmm. to make all of them impure sacrifices. They can't be tattooed or pierced. To yeah, be so a, they, sacrifice. a child sacrifice has to be a perfect, pure <laughs> sacrifice. Yeah, wow. So, okay. Yeah. We had to mar them somehow, some way. What was your experience like here as a child? Like your first couple years, like what was that like? Um, I was, at first I was really shy. Mm -hmm. I could not associate with the kids more. And they were lively. I was used to this home. Like, at home, it was really hard. Mm -hmm. With my brothers around, they could hit me like a lot. I came mm -hmm. with wounds mm. on my face and so i didn't you always had that head covering yes mm. didn't I, want to show barely anything, anything. <laughs> i could wear a hood and mostly was alone but then with time the kids started like making me feel mm. at home and the moms and the aunties yeah in the home so started playing too and enjoying life here mm. and understanding that it's about love not mm. how I grew up. Do you remember when you became a Christian? Was it here at Cherish or were you a Christian before? Uh, well, we, we grew up in a Christian home, mm -hmm. but really never understood the part. Okay. Well, we could go to church, do the, <laughs> do the practice, then we come back. Well, we were little, that is what we could see. Mm -hmm. And whenever I could not go to church, it was like, oh, you're not Christian, you're not born again. Mm. So when I believe, I believed in God, I would say, when I was little, but then I got to know him <laughs> like three years back. Mm. Yeah. Wow, yeah. And you, uh, so now, how long have you been a teacher for at the school? One year One and year? a half. And what do you teach? I teach the F1s, okay. English, and basically math. What is it for the audience that doesn't know, like Americans or people <laughs> outside Africa? What is F1? What? Uh, pardon? What is F1? Oh, F1 is Foundations 1. Okay. We have three foundations. Wait, four foundations, okay. three foundations, then F1, okay. F2, and then F3. So from the pre-foundations, they come to F1. Mm -hmm. So F1, F1 is the foundations one again, <laughs> and we do math and English. Okay. Yes. What made you want to become a teacher? Um, I never wanted to be a teacher, but there's, there was this opportunity that came, and I loved kids, mm -hmm. and I felt like God was telling me this is also another like opportunity to serve kids. Okay. So I took it on and later started to love it. Okay. Yeah. And what's your favorite thing about being a teacher now? <laughs> Seeing the change. Yeah. It's really magical. I refer it to magical because I don't know how to explain, but it is magic seeing someone that it is your effort. Like you've made them know this thing. You've made them learn this word. They are changing. They are growing. And mm. it's because of you. And mm. that gives me like inside joy. Mm. Yeah. That's mm. the best part of all. Mm -hmm. That's great. So now you love kids? Yeah, yeah I love kids. Yeah. I want to be a midwife. Oh yeah? Yeah, I want to learn on to learn midwifery. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Is that something you have to go to you have to yes, go to school? Yes. More school. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing, and it's been um, it's such a joy for our team to be able to experience the um, the education here. I think our whole team has just been so impressed with how much all, you and all the teachers just tr love these kids. Like teaching can be a lot of hard work; mm -hmm. yeah. it can be exhausting, right? <laughs> but you, I mean, I, I'm just so impressed at how involved all the teachers are, just with every single kid and and i've seen all the teachers get so joyful when 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 kids are you know getting things right and learning and it's just been a wonderful experience so thank you for hosting us um yeah and well, thanks for this is like the only place they could find the love for the for the kids hmm. so most times if you don't give it to them 
parents, they are more like they really most of them don't care about them. Mm. So if if we can't give it to them here, mm. then we try to do our best. Okay. Yeah. Our, our kids don't like school breaks. No. No. And you know, in America, yeah. no no school today is great. When our kids here is no school on Monday, they're not happy. What why is that, do you think? Do they love learning, or is it the community, or a teacher, or everything? Or? I feel like it's everything. Okay. The food, well, <laughs> they're fed, as the, opposed to okay. not. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, food outside, it's is really hard for okay. them. So if mm -hmm. they get this food and they get to be listened to, mm -hmm. and they learn something new, they my kids love writing. Mm. So if they have that, they're really excited about it. Uh -huh. So when it's Friday, like, teacher, are we coming to school tomorrow? I'm like, remember, Saturdays we don't come to school. Yeah. And uh, they're really sad about that. Mm. Yeah. That's just safe. Like, yeah. Nobody's going to harm me. I can just kind of let all that go. And as soon as they walk back out that gate, mm -hmm. they got to put on all that armor again mm. and figure out how they're going to get through. Yeah. There was... um. There's one girl student who uh, she has some burns on her face and it's, <clears> it's um, she must have fallen into yeah she must have fallen into a fire and it's affected her her hands and mm. and I would imagine she, maybe in the community she might have a lot of shame because of but here I mean all the kids treat her so it's like well there's nothing wrong nothing wrong yeah and she's I look at her and she looks me in the eyes with a big smile mm. and she she you know they like the pet mzungu yeah. <laughs> she does this she's looking at me like not. this yeah. <laughs> yeah. and like <laughs> and she, she's so just full of joy um was she like that when she first came or yeah. did yes it... she was like that and the first week it was really a struggle mm. to get her to go to school i think she was insecure mm -hmm. she kept crying mm. she wanted to she has a sister in foundations too so she just wanted to be with her sister so it was war taking her back to class. I think it took like a whole week mm. in the, when she first came. But after the second week, I think she started being comfortable mm. and doing it now. Yeah, mm. I love seeing the joy in her face. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's great. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Faith, for sharing mm -hmm. your story. And many blessings on your ministry here at Cherish. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. The older I get, the more I find myself wanting to be more intentional about the way I live, the way I eat, and the way I take care of my body, which is why I love to promote high quality health products on the podcast. This is why I am very excited to promote Mosh Bar. Mosh joined forces with the world's top scientists and functional nutritionists to go beyond your average protein bar. They have 10 delicious, uh, delicious flavors, three that are plant-based, and each Mosh Bar is made with ingredients that support brain health like ash ashwagandha, lion's mane, collagen, and omega-3s. Bosch is now the first and only food brand boosted with Cognizant, a premium nootropic that supplies the brain with a patented form of acetylcholine. Now, I'm constantly serving different nutrition bars because I, I typically go to work at like coffee shops in the afternoon, and I usually pack some nutrition bars because I don't want to spend tons of money at a coffee shop or at a nearby restaurant. So I always look for bars that are high in protein, low in sugar, low in saturated fat, and have ingredients that I can print out. And Bosch checks off all of these boxes. And here's the thing, they taste amazing. Uh, I just had their peanut butter uh, chocolate crunch and it is probably my favorite, although there's several others that are super, super good. Bosch also donates a portion of all proceeds to fund gender-based brain health research through women's Alzheimer's movement. So if you want to give back to others and fuel your body and your brain, Mosh Bars are the perfect choice for you. Head to moshlife.com forward slash theology to save 20% off plus free shipping on either the best sellers trial pack or the new plant-based trial pack. Okay, so that's 20% off plus free shipping on either the best sellers or plant-based trial pack at moshlife.com forward slash theology. Thank you, Mosh, for sponsoring this episode. My name is uh, Twiz Richire Leonard. At uh, Twiz Richire Leonard. Uh, it's a Western name from Western Uganda. Okay. Yeah. But you go by Leo or Leonard? Yeah. So most people uh, spell my name wrongly. Uh, Leonard, they usually forget the O in Leo. 
So I abbreviate it as Leo so that when I say it in full, people can spell it right. Okay. Yeah. That's great. And so how long have you been at Cherish? Um, I've been at Cherish for close to two years now. Um, I started here as a volunteer in on the 9th of January last year. Uh, I started as a volunteer straight out of school. Uh, I had not yet graduated. Uh, I also, uh, I was looking for places to, you know, uh, put my skills out there, get used to the professional space. And with uh, Cherish's hospitable environment, I made so many amazing people here. And uh, when Cherish offered me a job, I was very glad to take it. That's great. So you yeah. work right now in the pharmacy department? Yeah. Um, professionally, I'm a nurse, but um, I also help out in the pharmacy. I double as the pharmacist. Um, I also manage the, the store for, for, the pharma, for the hospital. Mm -hmm. So yeah, basically, that's what I do around Cherish. Okay. And so um, it's the hospital started off for HIV AIDS patients, mm -hmm. children specifically, or even adults? Like um, well, initially, uh, like with the history of Cherish, it started um, with wanting to care for children mostly, because uh, as we know, uh, children's health is something that is uh, overlooked by so many families here in Uganda. So when for children that are specifically suffering with HIV, there is a lot of stigma, a lot of ignorance that happens. And Cherish started by wanting to take care of those kids. And uh, the clinic specifically was to keep providing them with medication for their anti for their anti HIV treatment. Mm -hmm. So that is how it came up to you know continue to help out with even the older population. Uh, we further developed into, you know, taking care of other illnesses. The community came in as well. And now it's generally like uh, a, a clinic you would come to. Uh, we also started a service with maternity. But initially it was to take care of kids. And now it's uh, it's more of a full-blown, like, you know, hospital for mm -hmm. the community as well. Okay. Yeah. Help us understand a little bit more of HIV and AIDS and that's just kind of... Um, do you even, is it called a disease? Is it called a condition? Like just even just the whole understanding HIV and how it affects um, a person. Um, so HIV and AIDS are two commonly interchangeably used words. Uh, medically, uh, it's, uh, it's acceptable for someone to say HIV and AIDS together, but understanding it fully is HIV is the virus that causes uh, that causes, uh, that, that, that infests your body. Then AIDS is the aftermath of HIV. Like uh, when you have a high viral load, like your body is filled with so much virus, then it progresses into AIDS. So we interchangeably use both words uh, to mean almost the same thing, but they are two different things. Mm -hmm. So how I would explain HIV is um, when you initially get infected by one virus and then, you know, it multiplies within the body, then your, the, the, the number of viruses build, then it increases your viral load. Then when your body is, has been weakened by this, by this virus and it can no longer protect itself, then you progress into AIDS. Mm. AIDS is, uh, is, an, is an acronym for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Mm -hmm. So this syndrome uh, is used to mean like your body can no longer fight off any other disease. So your body is so weak, uh, it can no longer fight off on its own. Any small illness can easily pull you into a life or death situation. So for most people, uh, what uh, what we try to do is that if anyone has HIV, we try to make sure that they don't progress into AIDS because AIDS is usually like uh, terminal. You By the time we pull you back from there, it's really difficult. Mm. So we try to keep these people healthy uh, by encouraging them to take their medicines, uh, continue to provide their treatment, uh, follow up on them, see how they are doing generally uh, so that we help them live a normal day-to-day -day life, mm -hmm. yeah. So if someone um, starts taking medicine at AIDS, um, like... Um, like if it's their first if time. It's, yeah, if it's, mm. if it's like progressed into AIDS and they start taking it, can can they live a normal life with the medicine or is it almost like it's, it's progressed too far into their body? Um, 
there is a possibility for them to come back to healthy status. Okay. Because what this medicine does is it starts to fight off the virus from multiplying in your body. So the less the, the lesser it it multiplies, the older viruses just keep dying off and then you know like uh, the body continues to heal itself, mm -hmm. then this person recovers back to healthy life and uh, they can come back from the AIDS because we will do treatment for for those other illnesses that come up. Mm -hmm. But then we will, uh, when this person continuously takes their medicine consistently, it helps them to recover back to full health and they can live a very normal life. Okay. Yes. And tell us, cause, um, if they, because you've mentioned consistency yeah. is so key. What, yes. what's the, what if they're not consistent with um, their medicine? Well, like I said before, uh, the consistency bit is 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 very crucial because when when they start to take their medicine, their body now starts to get used to to it. Mm -hmm. Like it's it, its presence in the body gives it the condition of the viruses cannot multiply under those conditions. Mm -hmm. So when they are not consistent with their medicine, they have irregularities with how their body responds to, you know, the, uh, how the virus responds. Mm -hmm. And that will lead it to, you know, increasing their viral load and that will uh, also bring them down health-wise. So consistency in medication basically mm -hmm. is to help them stay healthy, like to okay. fight off the multiplication of the virus. Okay. Yeah. And crucial to know is like uh, whatever treatment they are on, they we have periods of time that we have to keep checking on them like um, we could give them a treatment to be to take for three months or six months and then after a year we have to take off a blood sample and check how much of the virus is now in the blood mm. and uh, for people who have been so consistent and so diligent in taking their medicine uh, there's a level they get to and you can't even trace it so wow. those are people that uh, get to a point where they are they, they are they are so they are safe for you know uh, it, we have those couples that have you know gone through this journey they have been consistent with their medication they even have kids who are mm -hmm. HIV free so mm. it's uh, it, it's it basically the consistency helps you to come back to the normal life any other healthy person would have mm -hmm. and this is what we strive for here mm -hmm. at church and do you feel like that's something that needs to be taught because the because and maybe you can kind of say what the culture like believes about um hiv and what um like a person that has it and so do they not know this the ever most people don't know that you can like live a normal life to the point where it's like it would be negative or your children could not have it um well uh when you look at the big picture uh there's a lot of stigma uh, around hiv here in uganda uh so many people here don't want to associate with hiv uh, there's those people that uh, when they when people find out that they have HIV, most of them isolate from the general population and, you know, they get into depression. They, they don't want to associate with people because generally uh, most of the time society doesn't want to associate with these people. So it puts them in a state of mind where they cannot live happily with every other person. Mm. Uh, most of them, you know, marriages break up, uh, families families break up and, you know, uh, people get into living as single parents, uh, mm. kids get neglected by their parents. And it's a very difficult state to be in. So for a family to, uh, to, to, to safely live together when they know their status, mm -hmm. uh, which is also very important for most people. But uh, from what we've seen is like so many, uh, so many people don't really have the knowledge about this. Mm. They, they don't care enough to know. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also more of like uh, they don't pay close attention. It's only those that are affected that mm -hmm. end up trying to pay attention to all of this. And it's, um, it, it's wonderful that, you know, at Cherish, we have these uh, meetings with these people. We call them in. We try to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Every time we have a client that comes in with us, we try to be involved. We talk to them. We share with them. They share with us their life story. We share 
hope with them. Mm -hmm. We try to change their mindset towards mm. all of this so that they can continue to live life like any other normal person so that they mm -hmm. have hope that tomorrow is a better day yeah. now that they have known what they need to know. Mm. And uh, with all the many stigmas that are happening, you know, families neglecting, uh, mm. people being uh, neglected by their friends, by their own family, they feel like outcasts. Mm. So every time we, uh, because we know this, that it happens in society, we try to address these issues. Because if you touch someone's skin that has HIV, you won't get it. It's not contagious by that. It has means within which it can spread. Mm -hmm. And we make it a point to educate the general public about these things. Mm -hmm. We make it a point to always give them this information so mm -hmm. that they know, so that they don't isolate these people and you know make them outcasts, push yeah. them into depression. And this helps everyone to live peacefully, to live together, mm -hmm. because friends are supposed to help each other. So when I know that my friend now has HIV, I could always help remind them to take their medicine, yeah. push them into a healthy status and encourage them, continue to, you know, push hope into their lives mm -hmm. so that, you know, tomorrow when their life is better, when they feel uh, that they can go on with their life, it also brings strength back to me that, mm -hmm. you know, I was able to impact this person in a beautiful way. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for explaining all of this, because I think most I mean, I didn't know so much of of HIV before coming here. And just it's been so good to just know like what it is and how to mm -hmm. how it can be cared for. And so one last question yeah. is what has been one of the biggest joys for you in your job here? Um, well, number one, I have to say, um, coming into Cherish, I was, um, I was fresh out of school. Uh, I didn't have any professional experience. So, uh, I came in as a volunteer just to learn the, you know, just to be part of the wheel, learn my, learn my roles. And, uh, one thing that Cherish added to my life was, um, it helped me grow spiritually. Mm -hmm. And with time, this has also helped me to push beyond myself. I can now, I can now help other people understand the word, understand God's purpose in their lives. And for me to be able to do that with every client that gives me the opportunity to share with them, um, I may not put it into words, but it is magical. Seeing people have that smile on their face and seeing them believe that you know there is greatness meant for their lives, whatever the condition is. Uh, I love the way the way Cherish has taught me how to spread the word because uh, when when I share when I get uh, shared with where when I get shared too, I learn so much mm -hmm. and being able to teach that and uh, I also love to teach. I love to be involved with people and being able to contribute to these clients' lives. It makes it, uh, it gives me a lot of fulfillment. Um, I used to, I used to tell my parents about it. At first, they were afraid that you know you're working in a space with people who have HIV. What if you also get it? But you know, uh, we are trained to to safeguard our lives as well. But knowing that I I can do this impact in this person's life. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday, I was sharing with uh, with Josie, someone from your team, uh, and. I think I shared it with Aubrey as well. Uh, like, you know, doing something for someone who is never always, who won't be able to pay you back brings brings phenomenal mm. joy into your yeah. life. Uh, it's something from John Brannon that I, I read some few years when I was still back at school. And uh, as I was learning how to, you know, how to give back, how to be impactful and it says you never live life fully until you help someone who is never able to pay you back mm. so cherish That's giving amazing. me this opportunity yeah. is phenomenal and i am so grateful to cherish for that yeah, yeah. wow well thank you thanks for being here and sharing with us and sharing a little bit about your story all right thank yeah. you so much too. thank you for having me Hello, Dowdy. How are you? I'm very fine. What's you? Uh, why don't you give us your, your full name for us? Uh, my name? Um, Chimba Dowdy. Chimba Dowdy? Yes, okay. Chimba yeah. Dowdy. Chimba Dowdy. Mm -hmm. uh, how long have you been at uh, Cherish Uganda? And uh, Now I'm making seven years. Seven this, years? This, this month. Okay. Because I joined Cherish. 
in 2017. 20, 20, 17, 17, okay. In, in yeah. June. In June, okay, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. What's that experience been like for you? Mm, I think sometimes you can find yourself, the work is so hard, but sometimes easy, so mm -hmm. not so bad. Okay. Yeah. Mm. I always do, I do painting, like, like the, the doors, mm -hmm. the windows. I do cleaning the gutters, mm -hmm. mm, fixing some of the things on the walls, like, mm -hmm. like, like, like pictures, such a kind of things. Mm -hmm. mm, I do cleaning tanks for the tanks for the mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. I do, I do. Mm, servicing the generator. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, when we are down with the power, mm -hmm. I, I do servicing the generator. Mm, cleaning trenches. Mm -hmm. mm, How about slashing? No. No slashing? No slashing. <laughs> Why not? I did, did that before yeah. I joined the maintenance. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So I sometimes, I, I do slashing, slash, slashing when I'm in a, in a teamwork. So in a week, we do teamwork uh -huh. as our operation teams. Okay. So we combine together and we do slashing. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes. I did some slashing yesterday. Mm, how uh, was it? It was good. It was I got good. I got blisters on my oh, <laughs> little bit. You didn't, you didn't have that. I had gloves too, but oh, I got Mazungu okay. hands. Yeah. And, you know, used to slashing. I understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was fun. Mm. Um, so, you know, you're a Christian, born again Christian. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, if somebody else is doing all these maintenance jobs, mm -hmm. as a non, if a non-Christian, they might just, uh, they'll do the work for money or they don't like the work or whatever. But every time I look at you, you got a big smile. Mm -hmm. You just seem to be very happy uh, doing the work you're doing. So um, why is that? What, 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 what gives you the joy in the work that you do? Why, why do you do the work that you do? Maybe is a better question. The way I can answer that question, I think it's a grace from the Lord within me within me because I find myself when I'm just happy like I am, when I'm doing my things freely. I think it comes from from the Lord. Mm -hmm. I can't say that I have some experience in it, I do what, but I think that mm -hmm. that joy comes from the Lord. Uh, that's how I can say about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. Like, what's your motivation? Like, when you go out and you, you're painting right right now. We pulled you off a job painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why are you painting? What's the motivation to do that? <laughs> First of all, what I put in my mind, that this thing which I, I does I cherish, it's 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 a calling, a calling, a calling from God. Mm. So I um I put in my mind that I'm not after money. I'm not after what, but it's it's like I'm doing my own things, mm -hmm. my own things. If you're doing your own things, you put all all of the effort. Mm -hmm. So that's what I, that's how I can say. It. Yeah. Mm. Do you like having uh, American teams out working with you? So much. Yeah. Like, why? Yeah. <laughs> why? Because they ask me such a question. They 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 they're good in asking. This and this, what is this? How do you make this? Huh. How, how are you doing this when you're happy? So they're, 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 good, they're good in asking questions. Mm. For us in our culture, we're not, we not good in asking. <laughs> really? We're hiding our things. Huh. Yeah, so huh. I like to work with them so yeah. much. And I was so annoyed when, when I was not yet working with any one of you guys. Yeah, yeah. So okay. Eddie prepared for me someone and yeah. <laughs> mm. What's your favorite thing to do uh, as part of your job? What's your favorite favorite? Work? Yeah, I think it's two things. There's building, building, mm, building, and and painting. Okay, mm, that is the most. Huh. Mm. Are you an artist? Do you feel like you're you like being an artist? Or, mm, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is okay, Well, last question. What is, um, you've been, uh, you've been here for several years. Mm. Um, you're a Christian. Mm. Everybody here is, has a, a relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, what have you learned most about your faith or Jesus from being here, mm. uh, at Cherish? 
Mm. One thing, the most thing I have learned, it's we are not just a me to be here, just to be to be a church serving. I don't have to be just a follower of Jesus, but I have to do, I have to to do something, which separates separates me to other follower of Christ, mm. to do, to take a step. Cause it's me. There's something which I was struggling with, forgiveness. Mm. So I I was feeling so hard when someone hurts me. Mm. So by the teachings which I already always getting in this place. It, I think he, uh, I, I can say that it opens my mind that if God God gives me, it's it's me, it's me. Even me, I have to do it mm-hmm. to do it. Mm-hmm. So that's the one of the things I think mm-hmm. I picked. To if I'm a follower of Jesus, I have to do the things mm-hmm. He did. Yeah. Be a disciple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, be a disciple. yeah so that's I have good. To walk the way he, he, he moved. That's good. Mm. That's one thing I've seen here at Cherish is everybody that works here is learning to be a disciple, mm-hmm. not just be a Christian, but not just believing with your head, but like doing the things Jesus did. Yes. yes yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's so it's so so good because for me, I always thought in my mind, I was I was thinking. If I'm a born again, exactly, I'll go. I'm a Christian, exactly, I'll just go in heaven. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but when we are in this journey, they, they were teaching us how to be a follower of Jesus, mm. how the things you have to do to be mm. a, a disciple. Yeah. So that's it's good. Cool. Mm. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And and now, wait, wait, wait. We got to do the Africa. You got to teach me your sh- the handshake. I've been learning the different handshakes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ready? How, boom, boom, boom. And then what? Yeah. Again? Yeah. And again. And again. Okay. <laughs> but sometimes it's an again and again. It's Sometimes it's One, this. Two, this, three. This. And then down. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then you're done. Okay. Because yeah, yeah. sometimes I just keep going. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm really glad that you were able to join us and to see what we do or how we love and be part of everything. It was really amazing seeing every one of you get to work in all the different departments, <laughs> really excited and you're really filled with joy to be part of this. My name is Maria Antonia and I am a facilitator in the Foundations Program. My experience here has been amazing. It's been a time for me to give back what I got because I've been a cherished since I was a young girl, probably five years, five Five years, since I was five years. And when I first walked into the gates of cherish, honestly, like any other kid, you've been used to some other environment. So you're walking into this gate, you know, no one in this place. And you're seeing there's this Muzungu, Laris, she was called a retro person. There's the other different people like, oh my God, how am I going to handle this environment? But one thing that kept me going and that filled my heart with so much hope is the love. I remember when I reached here, the first thing I got was a hug, a big <laughs> hug from Larissa, and that kept me like, wow. And as time went on, the love that I was shown as if I was in my own family. So mm. I found family, I found home, I found comfort and so much hope mm. around here. And since, since five years, Cherish has groomed me into the lady I am today and I'm really blessed to be part of that story and to be living that story because I knew nothing. I mean, five years, literally know nothing about life. But I was raised in an environment of knowing Jesus, understanding who he is, loving, being loved. So as I was loved, I feel like it's time for me to give back. It's time to share the love that I received back then to these children. Mm-hmm. And I joined uh, January this year. So it's a six month anniversary so far. It's, it's been amazing. Mm. I remember coming here for the interviews. I was like, okay, uh, this is not like school, school, Ugandan school, this is a program. It's foundations program. How am I going to, to go on? How do I even teach? I've never done teaching in my life. How am I going to do this? 
Well, interviews go on. I made it and I was so happy. It was an opportunity I didn't see coming, but well, when the Lord plans, you never know when it's coming. So when I started the trainings, it was amazing. Hmm. Amazing seeing how these other facilitators, Faith, uh, Charles, Ruth, doing these things. I remember walking into Foundations 2 and Miss Ruth was teaching and she was teaching them phonograms. Are the hour of hers like, okay, what's that now? Like, it sounded like music. Like, friends are like, okay, so what is all this? But the joy to see these children learning it, they could do it the right way. And I could see the joy and the smile on Miss Ruth's face. I was like, wow. Hmm. And that was before I started getting into work. That was still training. Now, time comes. <laughs> I have to be on ground, start teaching. I'm like, how am I going to teach? I've never done this before. I've never had time to sit with a child and have to get something into their brains, teach them something. But I'm filled with so much joy seeing that today in July, June, they learn so much from me. Mm -hmm. I'm able to impact in their lives, mm -hmm. not just by what they learn in class or math or English, but their character, their audibility, their confidence, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. It's see, actually see my the little Maria in them now. Yeah. Because like, mm -hmm. that was me. I was so young and all I could do is, all I wanted was love mm -hmm. and I received it. So I guess it's just time for me to give it back to them mm -hmm. and they reciprocate it, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my experience has been magical. It's given me so much joy and it has helped me actually find my purpose in life mm -hmm. back then yes i knew god i knew he has everyone is created with a purpose but i wondered what is my purpose like mm -hmm. what am i created to do but as time has gone on i realized that my purpose is to change people mm -hmm. and basically with what i say with what i do that is my purpose and i've seen it every day and seeing these students smile mm -hmm. it's, it's just amazing that's so neat. Do you feel like you're able to um, really understand what a, the children need when they come in just because that was you? Like you can, you like, like even just knowing how to talk with them, how to get like what kind of patience they need or all the things that they need. Do you feel like it's, it's just so, it's probably so much easier for you to be able to know how to be to them because that was once you? I would say it's been easy. It has it been? It's not been easy. Okay. Not at all because I didn't know these children. Ah. They're all from different backgrounds. And mm -hmm. today they'll be sad, tomorrow they'll be happy. And it was so hard to tell whether they are having a genuine smile today mm. or are they really sad? Are they really happy? Have they had fun? Have they enjoyed my lesson? Do they feel comfortable and safe around me? But as time has gone on, I realize it's time. Mm -hmm. Everything in life requires time. You give it your time. And as time has gone on, now I can tell that she said she's fine, but she's not. Mm -hmm. She says she's sad because of this. And it's so much easier because now we have like a connection. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> they actually, the girls in F Foundations 3, I was, they were one day talking and then they ran up to me and someone told me, Hi, Miss Maria, you know, like you said, you're like her mother. I was like, Oh my mm -hmm. God. I was like, Wow, it really made the best part of my day. Like yeah. someone seeing me more like a mother, a big sister, it has really, it's not because I've been here. Maybe, yes, I've been there, but the connection mm -hmm. and that required time and praying to God, what do I need to do? Mm -hmm. So it's just been time learning them as they learn me, as we interact, mm -hmm. giving them the sense of security. Mm -hmm and safety and the sense of confidentiality that you know what it's okay i am here you can talk to me so that has just grown our friendship and relationship with them mm -hmm. yeah were you here with the turnover from so we know that from the very beginning it was an orphanage and then it turned into family care um and just the process of all of that you were through all of that right yes and I, then can you tell us a little bit about what that was like for you as a, a child coming in and just seeing that change and and what it, what you like what your thoughts are all on that. I remember the first time I came here. Uh, there are only three, I think, four homes. 
uh, Hope, Peace, Hope, Ebenezer, Nisi, and Emmanuel. There were five. And it was so vacant. I know we had a very small building, and that was our school. And I've loved the fact that I've been there step by step, seeing everything change, their school being demolished and putting some other buildings there, seeing this building being set up, seeing this building here. And it's been, I know, I would say, magical and so much you're like wow now we have something new and you know the excitement when you're here oh we have a new building oh we have a new space it's been amazing and back then i was primary school so we were interacting with so many kids and i was like wow so it was more like i'm interacting with another world you know we were in here and it was just us and then when i started primary and we are interacting with other kids since nursery with other kids from the community I experienced a different life. I realized that maybe it's life isn't just here at Cherish. There are other people that are going through something else outside there. It's maybe they are struggling somewhere else. You hear someone didn't have lunch, you're like, wow, so that really happens. So it's been a changing process. Then we thought, okay, so we are about to finish primary seven. What's up with high school? And we could hear dreams and Larissa, Pastor Brent speaking of, we are going to have high school. Like, whoa, we're excited high school. But where? <laughs> I remember our first high school was in Nalugala. And it was just a simple room, a simple house. And it was exciting because it was filled with so much joy. Mm. And our hearts were filled with hope of, we are going to have another school. We are going to have a bigger high school. This is not it. No, no. You're having something big. And there we have high school. Mm. Right there, they're like, oh, my God, the transformation. It was like... So this dream we have been living and these thoughts have now come to reality. And then I realized that in life, you have to have your dreams. But as you have the dreams, pray about them and he will make it be. If it, his, it is his will and seeing high school, I was like, all right, this is amazing. Hmm. So we have high school. Then, you know, I started studying. I, then COVID came up. That was in twenty. Uh, 2019, 2020, and we broke off 20, 2020, March, I think. So we had to go out in the world and we wait for COVID. Hmm. But we were hoping that it would be something short and we could go back to school. But well, it didn't. And well, I had my senior fall somewhere else and it was a different life. It was a different experience because here high school, I knew these people. I knew most of them by name, but going out there and you're probably going to sit in a class that has more like 300 children. You know, no one, no one knows who you are. No one knows your status. No one knows what you do. I was like, how am I going to handle this? Will I survive? Are they going to die of emotional something because I have no friends here? Mm -hmm. So I joined and that was something different. Then we had uh, the computer lessons. That wasn't part of that. I was still being my senior for. And then I hear there's foundations programs like, okay, now what is the foundations program? But the day um, I was called back for an interview, I was like, oh my God, I had never in my life thought of that. Maybe someday, maybe, but I had never thought that I'd be called here to work back here and serve children. So Right from the time I came seeing everything change and something better coming up, different people joining and so my joy feeling around here, it's been amazing. Mm. So much filled with hope and has helped me grow my faith more in God. Mm. Seeing all this happen, then I'm like, wow, so God really is you know, alive. He really does work. Mm -hmm. And it has, it's been amazing. It's been great lessons for me throughout. That's great. One last question. What, and maybe Brenton, uh, you can both answer this and maybe you have different things, but what would you say sets this school apart from any other school that is out in the community? Um, yeah. Um, love. Love and the sense of security and the feeling that someone is there. They're not just your teacher. They're not just uh, Miss Maria or Uncle Charles or Uncle Adrian. But they're more like a father, more like a brother and a friend. Mm -hmm. When you go out there, when I went out there to do my senior school, I didn't get that. And I didn't. So I was like, so this is the difference. 
So here, it's family. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, no, I would say it's like home. It is home for them. Like if I say, when you, when you tell them you're not coming tomorrow, they'll be so sad because they're missing a great part, mm -hmm. the care, the love, the smiles around, and the sense of, I am here for you. We are going through this together. And the joy of learning something different every day. When you go out in the schools outside, that doesn't happen. No teacher has time to sit around and be like, hey, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Everything going good? No. All they do is, we are going to learn this and this and this. Boom, they walk out. You wait for lunch. You don't have even a good meal. You walk out. So it's more of come do the school thing and leave. But here, it's more than just the school thing. It's God, it's a love, it's joy, hope, and so much happiness mm -hmm. put together. So that is the difference. Mm -hmm. The fact that they get to learn about God, mm -hmm. they're surrounded with love, they get to do exciting things, things that make them believe that, I want to be this. I mean, today I asked uh, one of my children in F1, I was processing, I asked her, what do you want to do when you grow up? She told me, I want to be a mother. I was like, that's my girl. When I was young, I wanted to be a mother. <laughs> and you'll be a mother. And then the other one told me, I want to be a pilot. And every day, he tells me the same thing. Mm. Miss Maria, I want to be a pilot. And that gives me so much that their brains are young, mm -hmm. but they have hope mm -hmm. and they have dreams. And the fact that we are around, we help them grow that joy and their dreams. And we make them believe that it will come to reality. So just that makes this place something different from the rest. Yeah. And along with that love, like yeah. that, that is key. That is the most important thing, mm -hmm. um, is this idea of like, how do we now make the best, highest quality education we can yeah. in the midst of that? And we've kind of gone on this idea of really focusing on neurodevelopment and processing. Mm -hmm. And how do we just rewire their brains to work as God intended them to be? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, people like Marie are teaching them math and reading CIA. and writing and you know these really important skills and discipling them through the process and at the same time really setting them up to be able to live life beyond mm -hmm. um, this place and be those kind of just progressive thinkers and problem solvers and really mm -hmm. be able to sort out um, the things they're going to face and so we've we've ended up we've hired two consultants from the states one uh, a neurodevelopment specialist, Dr. and then Dr. Jan, yeah, and then Stephanie, a reading specialist, mm -hmm. and they have helped along with Lee and my wife write and develop this curriculum mm. that is really starting to solve some key issues that aren't okay. being solved in schools anyway that we know. Mm -hmm. and so it's exciting to be not only a place where kids are feeling safe and secure and full of love, but also uh, kind of taking some new ground educationally mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for giving your life to these children. It's so obvious that you are pouring, you and the rest of the staff just pour into these kids that's like given to you by the Lord. Because here these kids, you know, some of them have HIV, some of them have physical disabilities, mm -hmm. some of them have um, just really hard lives. But when they come in here, it's so obvious that as we've just been sitting with them in the classroom that they, they hold their head up high. Mm -hmm. They are like proud. They're like just happy. They are just laughing. And so it's like, you can just tell that they have that safety and love that is here. There's only what we have through Jesus mm -hmm. and through the love that we have for Jesus that we can give out to these children. And so thank you for, you are like, you are so investing in the kingdom in such a huge way because all these kids are going to go out into their marriages, their communities, their whatever they're going to be doing after what God's called them to do. And you are giving them such a gr good foundation of what I think is just um, so pleasing and honoring to the Lord. So it's been such a joy for us to see that. And it's very obvious that they get a lot of love here. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for what you do. Thank you for sharing your story and being here with us. I'm humbled. It's my pleasure. <laughs> I'm Dunguse John. At church, I'm here as a counselor. Okay. Yes. So um, as a counselor, so what kind of counseling do you specialize in here at, at Cherish? Okay, what I specialize in, I did the clinical psychology. So which means my job, it's not only for HIV people, mm -hmm. but it's for all other uh, diseases, I mean, other challenges. 
Mm-hmm. So like some disorders, depression, schizophrenia, but when I reached here, I found it is more of HIV okay. here. Yeah. So, so yeah, so you deal, so if somebody comes in mm. and they are suspected they might have HIV, is that why would they would come in here and get tested? Like they think they might have it or? Sorry? Um, when someone comes in mm. to get tested, mm. is it because they think they might have mm. HIV and so they come in and want to make sure? Okay. Yeah. Some people whom, whom I normally meet, they are those ones, maybe they are in a relationship. Mm. They found out that uh, their partner is not faithful. Maybe he's cheating on him or her. Uh, so they are scared and they enter in to know uh, mm. their status because they have found rumors that their husbands mm. are cheating. Also, if it's not rumors, there are those ones like, uh, for instance, yesterday, uh, there is uh, a lady who came and he found, because he was cleaning the house and he found the medicine there. The Arabies, and he didn't know that the husband is taking medicine. So he mm. came in, she came in fear, wanting mm. to know should it be that maybe also me, I have HIV. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he, also, there are those ones who are intended to marry. Mm. Uh, oh, right. He, they come because it's one of the requirements here in our churches that if what people want to get married, they should do, present whether they have tested for HIV, if they know their status. So to get married in a church, they have to go get tested first yeah. for HIV. Yeah, it's yeah. one of the requirements in that church. Okay. So someone might come to the hospital, they get mm. tested, mm. and the results mm. might... Oh, wait, first of all, so when they come get tested, mm. do you talk with them before they find out whether they're positive or not? Yeah, yeah. What does that look like? How do you, what do you talk to them about as they're waiting to hear whether they have HIV or not? Okay. When the clients came in, we f- I first will come them to feel comfortable. I talk about them, then I ask them what could have brought them here. Mm-hmm. So they tell me I've come to test for HIV. So we normally have a form we fill, but before filling the form, I first ask them, what do they know about HIV? Mm. Because I would want really to know what pushed them to come. So there is what we call a pre-test and mm. post-test counseling. So pre-test counseling, it's to prepare them mm-hmm. to go for test. Then post, it's when you are preparing them to receive the results. Mm-hmm. So we go through the forms after I ask them, like for instance, the results will come, we go through negative because when a um, client tested, uh, we have positive and negative and inconclusive. Mm. So you have to take them through all of those because we don't know how the results will be. So I prepare them to receive whether negative or positive. Mm. So after feeling the sign, I take them to the lab. Then after a lab finish doing the what they are supposed to do, they bring back the the, um, the form. Mm-hmm. Then from there, I first ask them, so the results have come. You remind me what we talked about. Mm-hmm. Then she will take me through. Are you ready to receive the results? Yes. When they are positive, I give them the results. Then I will first see how they are reacting. Mm-hmm. Of course, there are those ones who are in shock. Mm. They are those ones, like, they are those ones who come when they already know. Mm. Like, maybe they have been taking medicine from uh, Kampara, but they have shift, shifted here. So, for those ones, okay. they already know. So, those ones who will, who are just getting to know, we first they talk about it. There are someone who, some of them who will cry, who will say, mm. what am I going to do? I'm finished, what? So then that's when I take them through that being positive, it doesn't mean the world has ended. Then also I ask them if it's okay with them to pray together. Mm. So we pray, I share with them the word. After I ask them whether they are willing to start medication immediately. Mm. Because there are those ones who will say, ah, I can't believe it. I can't be positive. Let me first, maybe your machines are not right. Oh, really? So yeah. they will say, I will always give them a chance that it's okay. You can go and test from other facilities. 
if you found that they are positive, you come back. So there are those ones who will say, let me first go and try to other hospital, then mm. others are willing to start. Mm. Yeah. What are some of the incorrect views mm -hmm. about HIV mm -hmm. that some of the patients have that mm -hmm. you have to correct? Okay. Uh, some of them, uh, like those ones who are having children who are positive, eh? mm -hmm. they think that those children who are positive, if they share with those ones who are negative, they, like if they share the towel or that uh. if they use the same basin that maybe they will infect the okay. other one. So, mm -hmm. and the others, they think that when they are positive, they can't get, they can't give birth to children who are negative. So mm -hmm. those are the things I take them through. And others think that they can't get married. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel when somebody hears that they are positive and they just start, they feel like their life is, ended you know or are they just they're crying they're just distraught mm -hmm. does that is that hard for you to see that or yeah, yeah? it's hard it's hard because uh, especially when i've just joined when mm. i just joined i would feel uh these people is down and bringing them back but before joining here mm. as i told you that i did the counseling we first mm. before graduating they first we first we are supposed to first have a counselor who is supposed also to counsel you mm. so that you don't take your emotions <laughs> to other okay. people. So, uh, and getting, having knowledge that HIV, you can live with HIV and you achieve all your goals. Mm -hmm. I tell them with confidence that you will make it. Mm -hmm. You will achieve your goals. And through the conversation, I see them that mm -hmm. they are strong. Yeah. To start. And then you you pray with you ask if you can pray with them yes. at the end. Yeah, and they feel good when we pray with them. They go yeah. appreciating. Mm -hmm. We pray with them. I read with them the word. Then we initiate them in our care, and I have to do follow up. I have their phones. I okay. continue. They come month every month. Those ones whom we have not done the viral load mm -hmm. uh, to know the copies they have. When they start, when we start a client, we first aid them to come monthly. Mm -hmm. Then after six, six months, we do viral load to know whether the medicine has worked. Okay. After that, that's when we give them like three months. Mm -hmm. But within those months, as when she has started, we call them. Mm -hmm. We call them, how are you doing? Then there are those ones who will come, but I'm not sleeping. So we take them through the sessions. I feel like you have a very difficult job. <laughs> what is your favorite thing about what you do? What gives you joy? Why do you keep doing this this difficult and challenging job? Yeah, yeah uh, what gives me joy? It's when someone comes, when he or she is saying that the life has ended, mm. that I yeah, can't make it. Leave alone even the HIV. They are those ones maybe who are having social issues at home. They feel that the world has ended, but when I tell them that you can move on, and I feel the one who wanted to kill even themselves mm. are strong now, I feel joy that at least I've contributed something in someone's mm. life. Do some people say they want to kill themselves? Is yeah, that, that that's a... they want to kill themselves. Oh, wow. uh, there's someone like... Uh, there is a scenario, a client, we have a client eh, who is positive. She gave birth to a child, then she went to test it somewhere. They gave false results that the child is positive also. Mm. She came hearing, saying, at least let me die. I can't see my child also being mm. like me, taking medication like that. We tried to comfort her, and we did our test from here. Yet we found that child is what is negative. Oh, really? Mm. And she's so happy. Oh, mm. wow. Well, thank you for the work that you do. Um, I, I just think that you could, it's one thing to treat patients, patients with medication, mm. but the, the whole psychology piece, the mm. spiritual, the mental, mm. which you provide, mm. I think is so important. So mm. 
um, yet not easy. So thank you so much for what you do and thank you so much for sharing your story. Mm. Yeah. Then there is another thing which has helped them. Uh, we call it peer-to-peer -peer support. Okay. Uh, like uh, for us, we shall talk. There's someone who told me, you are talking because you studied it. Do you know how hard to swallow medication <laughs> every day? Yeah. So there we got idea. We normally call, we categorize them into three. We have those children from uh, from 13 years to 20. We normally have a peer-to-peer -peer support. Mm. Those are children who are positive. Mm. They normally come and meet and share their story. So when that one who is weak saying, will I make it like a, when someone is uh, like 14 mm -hmm. and he, he sees there is someone who started when she was younger, now is 20, will be encouraged. Mm -hmm. Then also we have the group of adults mm -hmm. who normally come and share their stories. And we also have the one of caretakers mm -hmm. because most of the children, they are not their biological parents who are staying with them, like their aunties, whatever. So we always call them to tell them how they can support those children uh, who are living with yeah. the children. Well, thank you so much, Joan, for thank sharing you. your story. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Thank you so yeah. much. All right, Brent, that was, uh, that was a lot of fun hearing from the people on the ground, all the different stories and everything. And I was impressed at how amazing they did on camera. Yeah, they did pretty good. <laughs> they did pretty good. We're asking, are you nervous? Like, no. <laughs> it's like they've done this before. Um, so I hope, I mean, I hope that this time, you know, hearing the stories, hearing the background and everything, um, I'm sure a lot of people listening are like hopefully excited about what God's doing here, mm -hmm. you know? So part of this is just, you know, to give, just to spread the information of what God's doing in one corner of one country in the world. So um, I hope that it was informative, but also we would love people that are they're like, what can I do? Can I do anything? I know a lot of Americans, people listening, watching, um, they're like, I want to do there. something, you yeah. know? So what are some future projects needs that if somebody did want to, uh, give financially to uh, yeah. cherish. Um, what what are some things that that could that you would like the people to give towards? Yeah, there's there's always a ton of need. You know, you know how it works. Your vision this always outpaces the resources. Like God's yeah. always like, I want to do this thing next, and then right. you have to step in faith into those places and start moving forward and just kind of watch God pull people together. And I think kind of the main thing that as we are launching this maternity, you know, we're six months in and that started, that thing is just booming. Mm. Um, we're already having to, we're ever grown out of our space. We're having to retrofit other buildings to make things work. And um, it's just really been a, a neat opportunity. I think probably the, the most tangible way that someone could be a part is the, our cost to have a baby is 107 bucks. Wow. And I think I mentioned that earlier. Mom pays seven, Cherish subsidizes a hundred. And I think it'd be amazing if this community, your community just said, I want to be a part of that. Hmm. I mean, if somebody sends in a hundred bucks or even 50 bucks or 25 bucks and say, I'm a part of a woman in Uganda mm -hmm. who's going to be discipled, whose baby's going to be cared for from the second she finds out she's pregnant all the way through being immunized on the other side. Hmm. And I get to be a part of that. Like that's, that hmm. would be pretty remarkable. So it's not just having the baby. It is a whole discipleship process. Discipleship. It's training. It's we do nutrition training and personal finance training and parenting training and trauma-based parenting training and wow. marriage. We do all these trainings and classes with her all the way through. So she's learning. We even deal with a lot of myths. There's like this crazy myth that if you look at your baby in the eyes when you breastfeed, that your hair will fall out. Oh. So here's this amazing opportunity to bond with your baby, but moms, moms don't do it because of oh, this crazy wow. lie that they've heard that is deeply ingrained. So we start working through what is happening when you look at your baby in the eye and how does this create this bond and what's the purpose of bonding? And so we're walking through all that kind of wow. stuff with these moms and, and our people, I mean, they're working hard and really passionate mm -hmm. about it. And we've just realized it takes the whole body to make this happen. Yeah. And it'd be super cool yeah. for other people to say, I want to be a part of that. And chances are, very few people, if anybody's yeah. hopping on a plane and come out here. Yeah. Um, if you want to, we can certainly talk about that. But how great that we have the opportunity mm -hmm. just to take some of the hard-earned money that we have and start building the kingdom in that mm -hmm. kind of tangible way. And as Leo said, um, the number one way in which AIDS or HIV, HIV is passed on yeah. is through mother-to-child transmission. But then yeah. you do it in such we a way do it the way that they won't. 
That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's not even just there's a healthy delivery, but we are now changing the trajectory of that family for generations because now that child will be born HIV negative, which is pretty remarkable. Yeah. Pretty remarkable. Wow. So a hundred bucks, uh, if you had like, say, I mean, I like to have goals. So if you mm -hmm. had like, uh, a hundred people give a hundred bucks. Yeah. That's a hundred moms and a hundred healthy babies. Yeah. And a hundred women discipled and trained and yeah, it's yeah. huge. Wow. Huge. So we're going to put all the links uh, or a link or something you can click on if you do feel moved to give. If you can't give a hundred bucks, 25 bucks, 50 bucks, yeah, whatever, whatever, any, any, any bit would, would help out. But that's, uh, I can testify from, from knowing you now, from knowing people that know you, from talking to the workers and now being here that this is uh, money well spent. And I said that as somebody who's very skeptical of ministries. I just, I, I don't, even people I kind of know from a distance, I'm like, I, do I know? No. Do I know where this money's going? So right. for a hundred bucks, um, I feel like one of those weird commercials, just like <laughs> for a hundred dollars, you get a nice white Bible, and, you know, <laughs> but really that's a remarkable that for a hundred dollars, this yeah. holistic discipleship of the mother and a, a kid born HIV free. Um, yeah, that's amazing. So yeah. please do pray about it. Consider it. All the information is below. Brent, thank you so much for your thank hospitality you. here. It's been an amazing week. So yeah, it's been awesome. yeah, appreciate it. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.